great. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm coming from the U.S. and I'm going to talk to you about uh, dexamethotamine, which is a drug that I've used um, very frequently in the past seven years. Um, I was working in Seattle, Washington, the university there, in the Children's Hospital for the past, um, I was there from 2008 till 2016, and then I'm recently at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And so, um, just before I start, I was curious to see who in the room uses dexamethotamine in their units? It's a small amount of people. Okay, good. So maybe there's some things to learn. Okay. So I have nothing to disclose. We will be talking, it's, this medicine's off-label, like many of the medicines we use in the neonatal ICU. And so I will talk about a non, an off-label application of it. I think we're all very familiar with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, or if you prefer, prefer the term neonatal encephalopathy. Um, this causes a lot of um, death worldwide. So about one in five neonatal deaths are due to an interpartum hypoxic event. It's responsible in 2010 data, almost over 700,000 deaths and about another two million babies that are affected by it. So in low income countries in particular, this is very devastating, but we see it in high income countries as well. The standard treatment right now is therapeutic hypothermia. Um, this has been around for a while now with um, the Cochrane Review, including over 1,300 babies. Um, the number needed to treat to prevent death or disability at 18 months of age is seven. So a good number needed to treat. However, we still know with babies, especially with severe um, uh, HIE, they still have very poor outcomes. And so we're looking for other adjunctive treatments. When we cool babies, they often can shiver. So the, the really severely affected babies sometimes, well, the moderate, or if they're on the mild, moderate side, they often tend to shiver, which um, there's a lot of drugs out there that can have been used to try and prevent shivering, but we typically use morphine in most of our units. Um, so morphine is one of the more commonly used analgesics in the NICU. Um, came out in the 90s, really not evidence-based. It was used in adults and just recommended. Um, there's not FDA approval for this, and there really hasn't been studies with efficacy, especially with cooling. However, I think it's familiarity with the drug. We tend to use this drug a lot. Um, and opiate receptors are ubiquitous in our CNS. <clears throat> Morphine certainly has side effects, and some of these might not be ideal in the setting of a baby with neonatal encephalopathy. Um, so we know it can cause respiratory suppression, bradycardia, low blood pressure, urinary retention, constipation, um, and paritis. In the short term, withdrawal is not such an issue, but some of these findings in a baby that is devastated with, and have, can have multi-system injury from hypoxic ischemia and encephalopathy, where um, if they're on the ventilator, maybe you're not so much worried about suppressing the respiratory drive, but certainly babies, some of these babies could be extubated and be on a non-invasive mode. Uh, when we cool them, bradycardia is very common, um, heart rates from in the 80s. Um, urinary retention can be a problem if they've had kidney injury and then gut injury with constipation. So some of these side effects would actually be undesirable in this setting when you're trying to assess the baby and promote recovery. Animal studies with morphine are concerning for neurodevelopmental effects, including reduced neuronal density, um, decreased dendritic length, uh, increased apoptosis, and compromised myelinization. So, the uh, human studies, which are limited, um, like the neopain trials and the follow-ups, haven't really shown some of the negative side effects, thankfully, but I think some of the animal studies are certainly concerning for the impact morphine may have. So there is um, a recent paper. Um, this is from Adam um, Freimeyer out of Stanford. This was published in 2017 looking at morphine um, essentially in the setting of babies with HIE, looking at the pharmacokinetics of it. And they used um, tandem mass spec blood spots. Um, and they had 20 neonates that they looked at. Um, and essentially what they showed was the clearance of morphine is affected. Um, it's best predicted by birth weight. Um, and it's influenced by the serum creatinine, even though it's metabolized in by the liver. Um, so that compared to full-term normal thermic babies, 
about when you're cooled, there's diminished clearance of morphine. <clears throat> and we know, uh, so um, one of the questions we'll, we'll tackle is with dexamethotamine, how is it, is that affected as well in, in the setting of hypothermia? So one of the questions I had was, is morphine the best medicine for preventing shivering in these babies uh, with HIE, given some of the things we just talked about? And what are some possible alternatives that we could use? So if we look in the adult literature for drugs that can prevent shivering, um, dexamethotamine um, has been studied in some randomized controlled trials. And the meta-analysis of these, so this is, a, this is 18 studies of which four were included here looking specifically at shivering. And we can see that um, it seems to be effective post-operatively to prevent shivering. And preventing shivering is important because when you shiver, not only is it uncomfortable, but your oxygen consumption increases dramatically. Um, and something we wouldn't want in the setting of a baby with neonatal encephalopathy. In adults with surgery, it's also particularly important because if you have a wound and you're shivering, it can affect how well that wound stays closed. So another, this is the Cochrane Review. So this included 20 studies, um, also showing um, dexamethotamine or um, alpha-2 agonists. This included clonidine as well, were effective <coughs> in preventing shivering. So some adult literature says, well, maybe this is a, a drug we could use in this setting. Um, so what is dexamethotamine? It's an alpha-2 adrenoceptor uh, agonist. And it has about eightfold more selective activity than clonidine. So it's very selective for the 2A alpha um, adrenoceptor. It has a shorter half-life than clonidine. Um, and it does possess some characteristics that would be ideal for a sedative. So it doesn't cause respiratory depression. It has analgesic and anxiolytic properties. Its onset can be rapid and it's titratable. <coughs> um, the effects can also synergize with other analgesics, and that's one of the reasons I think it gained popularity in the NICU after it was used in, in, our, in our units in the PICU, then we started using it in the NICU. On a lot of our babies that would already be on morphine or benzos, we would add this drug to try and then wean them off the other drugs. And that's kind of how it, I think it found its way into the, into the NICUs um, where I've worked. In adults, it's been shown to shorten hospital stays, decrease psychosis, and also um, some studies have shown improved survival as well as diminished sepsis. Um, the FDA, though, however, it's only approved really for um, 24 hours in adults, so short-term use. Um, it's sought to reduce inflammation, preserve sleep cycles, decrease stress response, and in numerous animal models of HIE, it's been shown to be neuroprotective. So how does it work? Uh, it's thought there's many areas of the brain that have uh, alpha-2 uh, adrenoreceptors. Um, one of the main areas is the locus ceruleus um, in the brain stem. So this is in the rostral pons, um, the posterior floor, the lateral ventricle. Um, and, and that area is thought to be important for modulating wakefulness. It can be a site for uh, hypnotic actions. Um, and by reducing the sympathetic output, um, and, and diminishing firing of inhibitory neurons, it's thought to work. It also works in the spinal cord um, through the release of substance P. So, just a little cartoon. So it can cause sedation. It can cause um, both bradycardia, um, and it can cause, it can affect um, blood pressure as well, causing hypo and hypertension. It can prevent shivering. It does cause, um, it can improve um, urine output, so it has a diuretic effect. <clears throat> and that's been shown in a number of studies that it's been um, protective of the kidneys and different populations, including some cardiac studies, post kids with congenital heart disease um, where it had kidney improvement postoperatively. The mechanism of action, it works through it. Um, when it, the receptor is bound, um, there's G protein coupling, diminishes the dentalate cyclase and cyclic AMP levels, which prevent um, influx of calcium and promote the efflux of uh, potassium and causes hyperpolarization and diminished norepinephrine release. Um, and it's cleared mainly by the liver, so there's some, um, the uridine 5-diphosphate glucuronyl transferase is the main way it's cleared, but also cytochrome P450-2A6 
which is expression which in, increases to adult levels close to one year of age. And then the metabolites are mainly excreted in the urine. And in the blood, it's 95%, 94% bound to albumin. So one of the questions I had when I started working in the NICU in Seattle, um, I'd come from, I was in the Air Force, I was in Japan, and then I went to Seattle. And when I started working there, I noticed they were using this drug all the time. And I was, I was quite surprised given that it was off-label and there wasn't really much information on this drug. And so I did an analysis just to see, like, well, how often are we using it in the NICU, um, as well as the other ICUs. And so from 2011 to 2012, I looked at a 16-month period, and we dispensed over 2,000 doses of it. And of those, there were 418 doses to NICU, neonates. And then <coughs> I looked again in 2013 and 2014, and our use at um, the duration had even increased. So when we first started using it, we limited it to 72 hours. And then I think people became comfortable with it. And they used it a lot longer. And given how sick some of our kids were, so this was a plot. So these are 157 babies <coughs> that got over 36 hours of exposure with the average of two to three weeks. And you can see some babies had up to 300 days of exposure of this drug. So we were using it a lot and for a long time. With that said, I got fairly comfortable with using it and assessing side effects with it. And it was a well-tolerated drug, which I think is what, at least in the short term, encouraged its use. Um, so what about, one of the questions I had is, what about using this drug in babies with uh, neonatal encephalopathy who are being cooled, since it, it is actually a very effective drug at preventing shivering with a potentially better side effect profile? So will it prevent shivering in our babies? And will it provide sedation? Those are questions. And what about the safety? And then will it be neuroprotective? So this led me to want to study it. So I got a small grant, and I started with a small animal model. So we had a neonatal rat model. And we looked at, um, this was really just a safety study to see if we exposed rats to different durations of dexmatotamine. Um, so they got doses three times a day for either two to four days, which in a rat is a much longer period. It'd be more like two weeks to a month. And we also looked at, um, the, in the setting of um, normal thermia and hypothermia, and did thermokinetics. And so the focus really was doing thermokinetics as well as looking at the brains of these animals. So this was not an injury model. This was just um, exposure. And so these were rats that, they, beginning at P7 to P12, um, the dose we chose was, we checked the writing reflex and came up with this dose because it kept them sedated for about a, a minute um, where they couldn't write. And, um, and so then we um, cooled them on a blanket and um, sacrificed them at P12. And essentially the histology, we looked at multiple places, the forebrain, we looked throughout the cortex, cerebellum, brainstem, and we really didn't see any pathology at all, which was reassuring, at least in the rats. We did HNE, caspase 3 GFAP for astrocytes, and CD68 for microglia, and essentially didn't see any abnormalities. With the PK curves, um, um, so this is plasma and brain, and essentially what, when, when the drug was given to the rats, it quickly made it into the brain. So there was a really strong correlation with plasma and brain levels, so we knew it was, it was getting into the animals' um, brain pretty quickly. And then when we cooled the animals, after injection, they, so these are controls, and these are the animals that had dexamethotamine, and these are non-injured animals. And what you see here is a separation of these lines. So by giving the drug, you reduce their temperature by about, their cranial temperature by two degrees Celsius. So it, it inhibited um, their shivering reflex, essentially, and, and, and therefore they were cooler. So it did show that it, it did work as an anti-shivering agent in the rats. Um, so then I decided, well, let's use another animal model that's a little bit more sophisticated. And so a lot of my work's been with non-human primates with a, we have a hypoxic ischemic injury model where we do, um, we insert an umbilical catheter essentially with an exit procedure. So we have that in place and then when, he, when he, we clamp the umbilical cord and we do it up to 20 minutes of clamping to induce um, uh, diminished blood flow to the animal essentially. So these animals, these primates come out and they're essentially almost dead, and we have to fully resuscitate them like you would a baby that has um, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Um, and so we've had this model for a while, and um, this was a pilot study we did using this model where I wanted to introduce um, 
we were trying to create, uh, our model had had um, all the features of babies with HIE as far as the laboratory markers, poor blood gases, eating up an effort, and a lot of the initial seizures, things like that, but we didn't have, we weren't seeing significant brain injury on MR, so we came up with a, a model that was trying to induce more injury, so after delivery we induced hypoxic events to try and have more of an insult to the brain to see if this would correlate with MRI findings consistent with patterns we see in babies. So with this, it was just a pilot, we had, I said, well, let's treat some of these monkeys with dexamethotamine as well. Um, see, considering we were using it in the, in the ICU and I imagined it was coming forward with cooling babies. And so these were animals, these were um, full-term macaques. We had four of them plus a control. They had 18 minutes of in utero umbilical cord occlusion. Then they were delivered by C-section. They were resuscitated by a team of neonatologists and then were mechanically ventilated. And then they got intermittent hypoxia, 8% um, O2, three to eight times a day for three days. Um, and so what we showed was, uh, it was essentially that we could use dexamethotamine to sedate the babies because we were typically using morphine. And in this we used a 2 microgram per kilo bolus at 1 in 6 hours and then we had 1.3 micrograms per kilo per hour infusion. In the babies we typically in the unit will start at 0.2 and will often escalate up to 0.4 the first day. Um, the highest levels we typically use in our unit would be 1.4 micrograms per kilo per hour. So the first couple years we started using it, we went to 0.7, and I think after people got comfortable with it, they doubled it. It wasn't based on evidence or anything, it was just the way we practice. Um, so these monkeys had necro necropsy at day nine. In this model, we did show that the MRIs, the animals developed a basal ganglia, thalamus, brain injury, stem injury, based on MRI, MRS, and uh, brainstem histology that was consistent with humans. And then when we, when we looked at, um, so we looked at pharmacokinetics of the, the morphine and the dex, essentially, and you, there's boluses given here and here, and then the constant infusion rates, and we calculated half-life, <coughs> which, um, these were not cooled animals, so you'll notice later in the humans this, this initial half-life is gonna be much longer. Um, so it was, it was 9.6 minutes, which is consistent with, um, with human babies that are, that are normal thermic. There were some differences with oxygen saturation, so, this is the pooled mean data, so when we expose them to the three minutes of hypoxia, um, the, the morphine animals, which are here with the triangles compared to the dex, their O2 saturations dropped more than the dex. Now this is a very small sample size, but that kind of potentially alluded to maybe the effect on the respiratory center. There were no differences in heart rate. Um, so another animal model that I want to bring up that, um, and unfortunately Dr. Robertson can't be here today, but her group, had, they have their piglet model of um, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and they've done some pharmacokinetic work as well that, that was published um, a few years ago. And they showed um, with dexamethotamine that the pharmacokinetics, there was delayed um, um, a washout of this drug. So the drug seemed to, the half-life of the drug seemed to be prolonged in this animal model when you cool them. So they, their most recent study, which was just published, they looked at, their question was, does Hypothermia plus dex, does it augment neural protection compared to hypothermia plus fentanyl sedation in the piglet model? And they were basing this off MRS biomarkers. So they had 10 animals in each group. And, it, and it, actually I reviewed their paper um, and I tried to be very unbiased because it, it had concerning results for me. Um, there were six cardiac arrests in the dex group, three that were fatal. Um, and the dex group also required more saline. MRS findings were similar but cell death was higher in the, in the dex group compared to the fentanyl. So this study was, was of concern. Um, and it wasn't clear, like, were these animals had isothurane, and did that have any effect combined with the dex um, in their model to explain some of their outcomes? And so they recommended caution about using this in humans. And this is, I had a clinical trial already going on, and fortunately I hadn't seen any, I'd never seen any issues with this in our babies or our cardiac babies. Um, and so, but that is a word of caution, I think, with, with anything where you have an animal study that suggests that you may have uh, an adverse outcome. So, what, what research is available in humans with this drug? And so, it's, it's quite limited. This is a study by Omar, it's 48 infants. And this was a retrospective observational case control. So they compared babies, 24 babies that had had 
dexamethotamine to some historical babies that had fentanyl. And essentially, the results for this were favorable for dexamethotamine. So they, had, they required less sedation compared to the fentanyl group, less mechanical ventilation, they passed meconium faster, and then they had less sepsis. Um, and there were no adverse events. So this was a, a small study, not a randomized controlled trial, but showed some safety and some benefits potentially. Um, and so these were just, this is just a little bit more data. So these were smaller babies, these are preterm babies. Um, they infused at rates at 0.6, 12 days was the mean duration. And so um, that's an available study. There's this phase two, three multi-center trial. Um, this author's out of Pittsburgh. These are 42 intubated, mechanically ventilated <laughs> patients, and they grouped them into two different groups. So babies that were between like 28 and 36 weeks, and then 36 to 44 weeks. So they had 18 in this group and 24, and they used very small doses. So their loading dose initially was 0.05, and then that was their maintenance dose. And then they had another level where they, they did this, they would fill a group, make sure it was safe, then they went to the next group, and then they went up, the next group was, um, 0.1 and then they went to 0.2, so pretty small levels of the drug. Um, and essentially they showed the levels were actually very hard to detect when they tried to do pharmacokinetics. This study though, if you looked at the mean duration of exposure, it was only six hours. So a very short window of exposure of this drug. And in that time period they did demonstrate that um, the preemies had diminished plasma clearance and a longer elimination half-life. They also showed safety. The third paper that's available is this, um, it's a pooled population analysis by POTS. So this is um, children, the mean age was 3.8 years, mean weight of 16 kilos. This only included four neonates. Um, and so this was um, looking at intravenous dex exposure. So four studies, which was 95 babies. Um, and they essentially showed um, that clearance um, at birth in term neonates um, was a little bit delayed, but did reach mature levels by one year of age. Um, and then in these in cardiac kids, they had a 27% reduced clearance compared to population given the bolus dose. So the studies we have, premature babies, cardiac babies, show some differences in how the drug is likely metabolized and cleared compared to adults. Um, so the question that I had then was, well, in, in hypothermia, if we were to use this drug, will, the, will, will we have altered plasma clearance of the drug in humans? And then what about our babies? If it's mainly cleared by the liver, and a lot of these babies have liver injury, will that affect how the drug is metabolized as well? Um, and then knowing that these babies often are hypotensive on pressors and bradycardic, will they, with, and those can be side effects of this drug, how will these babies do if we were to use it? And so um, I, did, I designed a trial to study it. Uh, mainly it was a phase one trial, so it was FDA approved. And it was to look at pharmacokinetics and safety. And so we, I really wanted just to understand um, how this drug is metabolized, since a lot of the drugs we use, that data is not available. Um, and I wanted to look at babies that were, had moderate to severe encephalopathy um, that we were cooling. So I also wanted to see, did it prevent shivering, and did it control? control pain and sedation. Um, so I hypothesized the clearance would be delayed based on um, a trend that we saw in the rat study that I did and just knowing in, in, um, in neonates. And so we, we compared our data to the POTS data, the population, and a lot of this was used uh, mathematical modeling, a bi-exponential equation with nonlinear regression, so we were able to compare the two populations. So the babies in our study, um, they were greater than 36 weeks. They had to have moderate to um, severe HIE. They had to be intubated initially at birth, mechanically ventilated, with a goal of 72 hours of um, therapeutic hypothermia um, and needing sedation and obviously parental consent. If they had a known chromosomal abnormality, um, they were excluded. They had to have a central line because they didn't want to have them poked at all for the procedures because we were. We had to do 17 blood samples to get good um, PK curves. So I wanted all that. The samples were quite small. They were 0.3 milliliters. And so it was only a teaspoon of blood per patient per study. So it wasn't a whole lot of blood, but it was a lot of draws. Um, if they had cyanotic heart defect, they couldn't enroll, or if, they were, if they'd already received dexamethotamine. 
Um, so we, we needed, ideally we were going to have 10 babies. Um, we had seven and I got, I took a new job, so it was a little bit challenging to finish the study. But um, the, the data that we have is consistent and, and I think it, it tells a story, so um, we'll look at this. So we did standard pharmacokinetic analysis. Um, so the way we patterned the drug, I didn't titrate for shivering because we would have needed too big of a population for that. So we had a standardized approach. And so we got blood drop times zero. And so normally what happened is these babies would come to our unit um, and then I would have to talk to the parents and consent them, which you can imagine that's a challenge when you had a, this is always unexpected, right? You have this baby with hypoxic and ischemic encephalopathy. The mom's usually still at the other hospital, so I'm talking to the father or the other spouse, or I'm talking to the mom on the phone and trying to get them consent. So um, most of these babies were cooled by five hours of age actively. They were cooled in, in the field and then started on an active hypothermia in our unit by about five hours. But the enrollment for the study was often about seven hours after that because of the time just to kind of um, get consent and talk with them. But once they were started in the study um, with the drug so that um, they were hypothermic at the time, and then we started at 0.2, and then escalated an hour later to 0.3, and then went to 0.4 micrograms per kilo per hour by two and a half hours. And they stayed on that through the rewarming period. So ideally, if they were started at time zero, it would have been 78 hours exposure to the drug. In reality, the average baby got about 65 hours of the drug because of the timing of consent and everything. So um, open label morphine could be given um, if they needed it for analgesia, for shivering, breakthrough shivering. We did NPAS scores. Um, and then we used this shivering scale that I modified from uh, another paper. Um, so either no shivering, it was mild, so it was located in the neck or chest, or it involved neck, chest, upper extremities or involved the whole body, essentially, and then they got scored. And then it was up to the nurse, depending on the scores, whether she wanted to give morphine to prevent it or not. We monitored heart rate and blood pressure. We looked for cardiac arrest. Um, and, um, and then these are a little bit busy, but I think if we just take some time. So because we only had seven patients, we can kind of look at the data. So these are the patients across the board here. So maternal age. Um, most of these were white um, patients. Um, all of them had prenatal care. None of them had tobacco exposures with moms. None of them had alcohol. Recreational drugs was only one of them. None of them had infections, except two were GBS positive. Most of them were vertex. Um, C-section emergency was four. Delayed cord clamping, one was a home birth, so they had nine minutes of cord clamping. They essentially, until the emergency team arrived, the, the baby was getting delayed cord clamping. Um, this just gives us some idea of what the babies were like. So they were, on average, 39 weeks, birth weight of 3510. Almost all of them were AGA. Um, two out of seven were female. APGAR scores at five minutes were three on average and four at 10 minutes. This baby didn't have a, this had a zero at 15, and I think a two at 20 minutes. Three out of seven required chest compressions, 100% needed intubation. Two out of seven required epinephrine. That baby had seven doses of epinephrine. Two normal saline boluses. These are the different pHs. So the average was 6.9. Average base deficit was 22. This was their admission temperature was 34. And then hypothermia was started at an average of five hours. These are some of the laboratory parameters that we looked at. So just to give you, kind of give you a context of where these babies were. So that their maximum creatinine so on average it was 1.46, but a couple had, this baby was very sick and ended up dying actually. Um, had a global hit. Um, many of them had, uh, thrum had liver failure, um, or I should say elevated ALTs. Um, intubation greater than 12 hours. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, four out of the seven, five out of the seven had clinical seizures, three requiring anticonvulsants. Five out of the seven had ionotropes, some with multiple, including dopamine, epi, hydrocortisone. Um, and then breakthrough shivering was only seen in two babies, and two of those required morphine. Um, none of them had bradycardia less than 70. There was one case where a baby was getting a pick line placed. They gave a dose of morphine and had escalated the, the dex dose right afterwards. And so that baby had some transient bradycardia. Then we just reduced our dex dose, and then it recovered. 
Um, four of the seven babies had full feeds by seven days, one died, none went home on oxygen, on supplemental, and three went home on NG feeds. For MPAS scores, only 10% had scores greater than three, um, so we assume that meant it had this, the, the medicine at least seemed to um, demonstrate decent pain control. And then we did, um, all babies had ultrasounds within the first day. Most of those were normal. Most of the EEGs were, showed some abnormalities. And the MRIs, um, there were only two that really showed um, some significance. The MRIs, for the most part, weren't, weren't that bad in these babies. Um, so the first baby died, the, the next six actually all did quite well and went home and um, my last contact with the families, they were still doing well. So then we looked at how did the, what were the pharmacokinetics of this drug and compared to that POTS paper. And the predicted would be this dotted line here. And what we saw was that, so this is the infusion here. So some of the babies, so I just, this is just a characteristic curve of patient one. And so this is, was the baby that was very severely affected. And at one point, um, the doctor elected to reduce the dex dose because the baby was still on pressors and was wondering if that was why. So it went down to um, 0.2. Um, but this is the dose. This was the therapeutic hypothermia period in green. This is the predicted line, what we would expect it with the dot. And this is what we actually saw. And so what we saw was, um, there's an initial drop, and then it, it rose up and peaked, and then the washout period was delayed from what was predicted. And so um, we also saw this, um, we noticed that the, because we were expecting it to reach this level, we wondered why it took so long um, to, to reach that curve. And so one of the questions I had, which I'll get to in a minute, and I'll just, let me just show you this. So these are the, essentially the population curves for the different patients, and for the most part, there are some differences, but this trend of kind of this delayed half-life, um, elimination half-life was seen in all of them. So the initial rise was delayed in all the babies, and so was the initial half-life um, for the babies. Um, so one of the things we did is we did an experiment where I took the IV tubing setup that we had for all the babies, and we mimicked the experiment because I was wondering why are they taking so long to get, we weren't detecting drug levels that we would expect till about 12 hours of age. And so I wondered, is the tubing is some of the drug getting taken up by the tubing. And so we set up a number of the IV poles with three different experiments, and we did the same amount of labs, and we did them out to about 22 hours. And essentially what we saw was that the tubing does absorb a lot of the drug, and then around, as you get to 12 hours, the drug rate starts to increase. And so um, I think this was important to know that the, the tubing itself potentially is absorbing that drug. And it also made us question you know, you wouldn't, at the doses we were seeing in the beginning, our levels were actually not where we would expect. So we wouldn't necessarily expect side effects of the drug when we were starting because the, the levels weren't even really detectable until around 12 hours of age. Um, so what we noted was both the initial and terminal half-lives in the post-diffusion phase were much longer than we expected, and we're attributing that to the cooling. So the, the initial half-life was about seven times longer, so it was 1.86 hours versus it's normally supposed to be around uh, 12 to 15 minutes um, in normal thermic babies, which is somewhat similar to the monkey study. And then the terminal half-life was about 16 hours longer, so it stayed in the body about 17 hours compared to 2.7. Um, clearance was increased, which was um, not necessarily expected. Um, we did look at correlations to see if, like, did, did liver injuries based on ALT did that correlate um, with how the drug was clear, cleared? Thinking, well, if, the, if, the, if these are babies with liver injury, maybe they're not clearing the drug as well. And actually, there was no correlation there. Um, we didn't have any adverse outcomes or serious events in the study. So thankfully, you know, the piglet study was concerning um, with some of the cardiac arrest. But in this case, we, didn't, we haven't had it. Um, outside of this study, uh, we had just cooled and used this drug in other babies prior to this with cooling um, in the unit, and subsequent that we've used it. I've used it on babies on ECMO as well, getting cooled, and we haven't had any um, evident issues with it. So it, thus far, clinically, at least, seems to be effective and safe. Um, breakthrough shivering at these doses, up to 0.4, can still occur. In clinical practice, I typically titrate to effect, so I'll just increase the dose till the baby stops shivering. For, and if, while I'm watching the, the heart rate and the blood pressure to make sure I'm not having a negative consequence. 
And usually you can just titrate to effect and it will be effective. Um, certainly I think we need larger trials to see, like, for effectiveness. So this was just a, you know, phase one. But it'd be, I think it would be nice to compare this drug head to head with morphine to see, is it more efficacious at preventing shivering? How does it compare for safety and sedation? And also you'd like to look at, are there any neuroprotective effects of this drug in these babies? Um, and so with that, I'll pause and answer questions. <laughs>